Our next speaker is Dallas Broadway. Dallas is a, a trainee at SUNY Downstate doing his second residency and fellowship in interventional radiology and diagnostic radiology after completing his studies in internal medicine. I've tried to develop the next generation of interventional radiologists by combining this program of internal medicine, diagnostic radiology, and interventional radiology into a seven-year program. Dallas is one of the shining lights of that uh, initiative. And Dallas will be an incredibly good interventional radiologist when he graduates at the end of the year. I asked Dallas to speak about stents so that patients might understand the nature of a stent, the fabric of a stent, the needs and values of a stent, and the cautions for stents. So Dallas, thank you. So what is a stent exactly? A stent is um, any tubular structure that can keep open a vessel, either an artery, a vein, possibly lymphatics. This is a CT rendering um, 3D image of a stent. Is this also pointing? Um, you can see in the left of the lower image. Where is it placed? This is a standard um, interventional radiology suite. You have an x-ray tube that goes through the patient, the image intensifier and it absorbs the x-rays and then it gets it off to an image so that we can actually see what's going on. What are the mechanical properties of a stent? A, skin, a stent is a lot of properties such as scaffolding, radial force, um, what is required by the inside of the stent to keep the vessel open. So anything inside, hoop strength is how well is the stent um, designed in order for not to be collapsed by outside structures. Flexibility, how flexible it is, how much the coverage in the lesion within the vessel itself, how well does it conform to the vessel. If it's a curved vessel, if it's a straight vessel, how well does it go in? If you get vessel wall opposition, how well is that um, stent actually going up against the vessel wall without causing too much stretch or too little um, coverage? And how well can we see it in other um, properties such as x-rays or MR? Designs of stents, they're self-expandable, balloon expandable, they're coil versus tube. They're slotted to versus modular. They're long and short, wide and narrow. Um, they're thin or thick. A lot of just simple mechanical um, structures, rough and smooth type of alloys used to make the stent. Um, Self-expandable is simply a simple stent that's designed that goes over, a tube, goes over a wire inside of a sheath. As you bring back the sheath, the stent automatically deploys inside the vessel. There's no... Um, Nothing else required to open up the vessel. It opens up automatically as you take back the sheath. What are the properties of a self-expandable? They're elastic materials. They're, it's a thermal, injury, um, thermal memory, so whenever it's made outside in the factory, it's made at a temperature that automatically will absorb that same um, design when it's deployed in the vessel. Um, they're compressed, constrained to the delivery system. As I said, most of them are nickel, um, a nitinol, nickel, titanium, thermal elastic alloy. And versus a balloon expandable, balloon expandable on the other hand is, um, it's actually opposed to the outside of a balloon. And it's the same system as over a guide wire. It's um, as soon as you pull back the sheath, um, you have a balloon that's, you blow up, give it a certain atmosphere or pressure, and it deploys the stent. Again, it's a coil mesh, zigzag design. Um, it's attached to the balloon and it auto expands also to calculate its size once you blow up the, the um, balloon. And these come from the factory is how much atmosphere you have to give in order to blow it up to a certain diameter. What do we actually look for in a stent when we um, are plate one to place a stent? We look for trackability, how well does it go over the wire into the vessel? We look at um, pushability, same thing, how well does it, how it go into the vessel to form um, the crossing profile? How well does it um, choose the inside of the vessel? How well will it open versus how well will it go over a if you have like the azagus, you know, the azagus is a curved shape um, vessel. How well would that vessel conform to the, um, the natural shape of the 
ion vessel. There are two groups of stents. There's coil designs and there's tube designs. A coil design is simple, continuous wound wire series of flat um, sheath coils, greater strut width. And there's no connections between the struts. It's more flexible, but it's um, less radial strength, so it's, it can collapse easily. And there's a wide gap that allows tissues to dangle. And this is an example of a coil versus a tube structure. There are all types of um, different stents, such as modular, slotted tube, helical stent. Pretty much the way they're designed is um, how well they're going to stay open versus how well they're going, how well the radial force is on a stent or how flexible they are. The more rigid they are, usually the um, less flexible they are, but the more radial force they have and the more hoop strength they can um, absorb. Tube design wide versus narrow. There are more struts versus less struts. Um, thin struts versus um, 50 to 75 micrometers versus thick struts go up to 140 micrometers. Just a side note, they, um, they're reporting in literature thin struts associated with a reduction of restenosis in arterial. Um, there's not very little data to support um, this in the veins. Here's a square, square thick versus square thin versus round material. Composition, they're made of ma mainly uh, metal alloys. They are making now polymers, um, nitinol, tantalum, platinum, or niobium. Majority of them are stainless steel. Limitations, um, is anytime we place a stent in the body, there can be limitations such as comp manual compression from an outside um, muscle, or as I'll show um, in a few minutes, other um, arteries can compress a vein. The indications for venous stenting, this is from the Society of um, European and Intermensal Radiology in America. There's a whole list of syndromes. I um, just want to show you that they do not list CCSVI yet, <laughs> but there are indications that um, for CCSVI, such as multiple restenosis, elastic recoil, stenosis, complications of prior treatments, and complications of tears, flaps, or occlusions. Here's one of those complications. You have a thrombosis, internal jugular with um, collateral vessels, wire getting through the thrombosis, and then actually shooting a venogram from the thr um, thrombosis. Here's an occluded stent. There's another indication for restenting. What are the diseases associated with CCSVI? They are May Turner syndrome, Nutcracker syndrome. Um, internal jugular hyperplasia stenosis and azygous hyperplasia stenosis. What is May Turner's? It's pretty much compression um, from an internal iliac artery onto the internal iliac vein. As I show here, the, the top arrow is pointing at an internal um, iliac artery or a common internal iliac artery. It's compressing the vein and causing a filling defect throughout the entire internal, um, common internal iliac vein. That's the thrombosis. What is a nutcracker syndrome? It's compression of the left renal vein by the superior mesenteric artery. Pretty much the shape of a standard nutcracker. As you see here on the CT scan, um, it's an axial CT scan of contrast. You have the vein going through the aorta from the vertebral body. Next is the aorta, then you have the vertebral vein, then the superior mesenteric artery. And it's causing compression at the arrow. What are the complications of stenting? Um, we can get vessel rupture if we overdilate a vessel, um, hemorrhage, hemophysis, epistaxis, pericardial tamponade, um, cardiac failure, recurrent laryngeal palsy, stent migration, pulmonary embolism, and groin hematoma. Now, I listed all of them. These are very uncommon. Um, most of these are listed for other things besides the internal jugular. It's common to stent subclavian steel syndrome or stent any other um, part of the body for indications as. Um, and that's where they get carotid stenting and um, you can get all, all these other um, complications. Stent migration, it's a picture of where the stent is actually migrated down into the brachial cephalic from the internal jugular. Now I try to look at studies to show um, stenting and the outcomes done in venous diseases. There, are, there is really no study done in internal jugular veins. So I try to do the best I could to compare 
although this is not a great comparison, doing um, IVC in um, lower peripheral veins. But um, a study that was done showed 133 patients, iliac and femoral popliteal um, DVT and stenosis. And what they did, they looked at, after they did um, thrombolysis, actually stented from the, the IVC all the way down to the popliteal veins and the knees. They caused external compression in the stent. They looked at instant restenosis and if there's intimal thrombosis in the stent. And what they found was um, stent occlusion occurred in eight out of 123 patients in a mean of 423 days. DVT occurred in eight patients with the majority being asymptomatic after the stenting. And this is pretty much what they did. They stented all the way from the heart down to the um, above the knees. Now why that doesn't really correlate to jugular, it's a whole different disease process is the way it flows, but um, it gives you a good example of what so far they've done in, vein, in the venous system. Here's May Turner syndrome. Um, it's a common um, disease associated with CCSVI and also a study they, where they treated 30 patients and stented the, the common um, iliac vein. Another disease process, um, the reason why I want to mention this is um, it's called paget Schroeder's disease. You get hyperplasia of your scalene muscle and what that does, that causes compression of the subclavian vein. And why is that important? As you can see here on this um, MRI, coronal MRI, there's thrombosis in the entire, from the axillary to the subclavian vein, and a stenosis. On this image, um, there's a lot of collateralization going up. There's a subclavian vein going down to the brachiocephalic, and there's a really tight narrowing at the um, subclavian. And that's due to um, the scaling muscle being hyper, hypertrophy. And the reason why they don't stent that, the surgical treatment, is because if you stent that, they had severe collapse of all the stents because the muscle itself, unless they did first rib resection, this, the muscle would always clamp down on the stent and cause thrombosis or repeat thrombosis, so they had to um, surgically treat it. What is the complication of stents? Why do they occlude? Uh, the highest regarded um, complication is from neal intimal hyperplasia, thickening of the tuna intima of the blood vessel, it's thought to be activation of smooth muscle, um, smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts of the vascular media and adventitia, um, excessive intimal synthesis of collagen. And what is the neal intima initially? It's actually re, it's, um, composed of vascular sm smooth muscle cells derived from all three vessels of the layers of the vein. And what I try to show here is an artery versus a vein. You can see how th thick the artery is compared to the vein. And the tunic intima, the top, um, most top structure, you can see that valves are located in veins, not in arteries. There's still smooth muscle making up both from the artery and the vein. Hypothesis of why this actually occurs, for venous um, AV fistulas formed from surgery, they think it's due to um, surgical trauma of the vessel attaching it to the artery. There's hemodynamic stress from a graft vein or gra arterial vein anastomosis. The stent itself has a foreign body um, can attract macrophages, um, release cytokines and growth factors causing pretty much fibrosis or intimal hyperplasia. Um, less defined intimal layer of the vein causes fluid um, accumulation and backflow resulting in thickening. And they think it could be a genetic predisposition of um, basal constriction and endothelial smooth muscle cells. And a treatment of initial stenosis by balloon angioplasty um, causing smooth muscle activity. Um, here's neal intimal hyperplasia with inside the stent. You see this low attenuated lesion on, on this uh, sagittal CT scan, pretty much showing it's not um, restricting the flow within the vessel, but you can see it within the vessel showing that it's thickening of the smooth muscle. Here's neal intimal hyperplasia in the internal um, jugular, causing pretty much strict um, flow limiting venography. And one of Dr. Stefani's IVIS studies, um, you can see the wall is very thick and there's very narrowing of the um, true lumen of the vessel. What happens after a stent? Well, usually you get put on aspirin, Plavix. Um, you can get put on Coumadin or Warfarin sodium. You can get put on low molecular weight heparin, um, uh, Rivaroxaban, which is newly approved for um, thrombosis, or oral thrombin, direct thrombin inhibitor that they don't require 
any type of um, lab follow-up studies. You might you may have to get another ultrasound, follow-up CT scans, MRIs, another if there was a complication from a stent, you have to have another venography. So the only question I ask is stenting indicated for jugular system. That's something actually more randomized going through clinical controlled trials need to prove because there's such limiting data right now. And um, there are certain indications for a stent now, and we need to follow up, continue to follow up patients to see how well those stents do over time. And thank all of you for your time and cardiac presentation. <laughs>